Hello everybody, this is Brian O'Haran speaking. I'd like to just say a few words here that were often spoken by Jack Webb. Ladies and gentlemen, some aspects of the story that you will hear tonight is most likely true, are most likely true. The names have not been changed to protect the innocent. Just the facts, please. Just the facts. I also have with me tonight as special guests, the three monkeys. Hear no evil, see no evil, and speak no evil. They're here to remind us that we should always try to hear, speak, and see no evil as we discuss the Winston education debacles. We'll speak about only one tonight. We're not going to be talking about the, the uh, audit uh, problem tonight, just the, uh, the kind of conflict between the town, the schools, and the state. As Jack Webb said, often on his program, Dragnet, for those of you who remember it, just the flat facts, please. Just the facts. Now I'm going to put on the screen for a little while, not long. You won't be able to read this, but I'll read it to you tonight. A response to the letter that we talked about on the last program, which I ran two weeks in a row. There was a letter from the um, State Board of Education to the town and to our Board of Education stating what they wanted uh, the minimum fund balance to be and to make sure that the town was in compliance with that minimum fund balance. The town selectmen got together. They went over the, the letter from the state. They had a meeting special meeting to discuss the minimum budget requirement amongst themselves and they empowered the town attorney Kevin F. Nelligan to write a response to the state Mr. Brian Mahoney Chief Financial Officer State Department of Education 165 Capitol Avenue Hartford, Connecticut I'll read that to you now the subject is the town of Winchester minimum budget requirement Dear Mr. Mahoney, the Board of Selectmen has asked me to respond to your letter of August 16th, 2011. That's the letter we discussed in the last program. In which you indicate the town is in non-compliance with a minimum budget requirement, MBR, by $1,358,149. I'll repeat that. $1,000,000. $358,149. I have provided below a detail how the town believes it can meet the MBR, minimum budget requirement, of $19,958,149. The Board of Selectmen request that you review these items and determine if they can be incorporated into the MBR calculation. I've got a little short list up there, but I am going to read each one to you. It will be helpful also if you could provide your reasoning for each item. So we're explaining, the town's explaining its reasoning to the state, and then in return, they want their reasoning uh, one way or the other on these issues. Number one. That COS I have on that sign means consolidation of services. The town has experienced a declining enrollment, which has been factored into the MBR calculation, resulting in a reduction of $211,079. However, the town believes a further reduction of $568,000 $366 is warranted. The Town Board of Education closed the 7th and 8th grade program 
and contracted with the Gilbert School to provide the services previously supplied by the town. The Board of Education budget demonstrates savings of $568,366 $568, from the consolidation. The calculation leading to this number is attached as Schedule A. Page 2. School closing. Currently, the town of Winchester has three school buildings. The capacity of the building is 1,836, and the enrollment for the town is 669. When the decision was made to close the 7th and 8th grade and outsource the education to the Gilbert School, the Board of Education publicly indicated one of the schools would be closed. The budget presented to the town voters reflected the anticipated savings from the school closing only after the budget was finalized did the superintendent recommend that no school be closed. The minimum savings in staff cost from closing bachelor school, if that is chosen, is $548,414. The minimum in savings from staff costs for closing Pearson school, if that is closed, is $764,000. $618. These numbers are detailed in Schedule E attached. Attached to this letter are three pages of numbers, uh, the source of their information in this letter. And I believe most of those numbers are taken from the school budgets. The town is asking that credit be given for these documented savings. Number three. The town will pay $151,512 for the remediation for asbestos at the Pearson School. These funds are from the town capital amount and are fully attributable to taxpayer funds. Number four, special appropriation. The town will make a special appropriation for the benefit of the Board of Education to cover the excess cost of special education above the amount budgeted by the Board of Education. The supplemental appropriation will, however, be limited to the unrestricted revenue received by the Town of Winchester from the state, the largest of which will be the excess cost reimbursement payment. The payment in the prior fiscal year was $987,000, and a similar payment is expected this year. Thank you for your reviewing this information. You may respond directly to me, that's the town attorney, Kevin Nelligan, and I will discuss your response with the Board of Selectmen. Sincerely yours, Kevin F. Nelligan. Copy, the town manager, the board of selectmen, Senator Andrew Rohrbach. So that letter went out, went out on uh, August 24, 2011. It was due by the, by, uh, the 26th, so they got there in time and they sent that letter off. So this is the selectman as worded by the town attorney. He was at the meeting when they met, as was the town manager, and other people were there in the audience, some from the Board of Education, I think, and others that are running for office, etc. It's held in the uh, blue room down at the town hall. And they decided to send this letter in 
response to the letter from the state that re was received a few days earlier. So that's that. Now, what they're trying to do is justify that they are meeting and can meet the minimum budget requirement by doing the things that they say they can do in this letter. Now it's up to the state to come back now and say yes or no or one way or another. Now remember, there are there's a lot of confusion. Although there are state statutes, and we'll talk about a bit about that in a few minutes when we read the other letter from the uh, superintendent to the state. There are state statutes, but there are always interpretations of statutes, as you know from normal law everywhere in, in, in America and elsewhere. And uh, they may or may not be interpreted differently from town to town and uh, from year to year and all that kind of thing. Um, these statutes, uh, some of them are in question as to whether people are following or not, whether they're consistently employed or not. That'll all come out in the wash when we get all the facts out that are agreed to by the three parties. Um, and uh, we have one set of rules that we all understand and a lot of answers from the state as to why we can or can't be considered um, as other towns and cities are in the state. So that's, that, this is uh, going to be very important for the evolution of this whole uh, education confusion that we have in our town now and have had had for many years, but it isn't going to be solved with, as they say in boxing, it won't be solved with one punch and one effort. It's going to be, it's going to take time. It's going to take discussion. It's going to take maybe compromise. Now, I did make a mistake in my last program. I think we got it up on the internet. I'll just tell you quickly that uh, I, last time I said that 40% uh, only 40% of the towns and cities in the state made the MBR. That's really should be 60% make it, 40% don't make it. And one of the questions, although it's not worded, any of these questions aren't worded in this letter, is well, why, what happens to the 40% that make it, that don't make it? Do they get penalized? Do they get fined? What, what are the rules? that they fall under. Why are, why are they not making it? You know, so we, we do know that there are a lot of people in, in the uh, cities and towns in the state that are in dire financial trouble right now. We've got a lot of people who uh, are in, I've talked to them even around town here and they're hurting. You know, they tell me, Brian, we're hurting. You know, senior citizens are hurting. Uh, taxpayers are hurting. You ought to hear the discussions about taxpayers uh, at Island Lake. I mean, it's a, uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, a few people have stopped me in the last week and told me that their taxes have like uh, gone up, uh, twelve, uh, ten, doubled over the last twelve years. Now, if any of you out there are pay real exorbitant uh, taxes, say say you tripled over the last ten years, or you quadrupled or quintupled, let me know when you see me, or give me a call on the phone and tell me, and I'll let people know that. But um, it's tough up there now, and uh, you know sometimes you got to make a decision. Uh, this this recent uh, uh, hurricane reminded me of this. Sometimes you got to make a decision as to whether you're going to cut a tree down that's rotten and it could fall onto telephone lines and the cable lines, or you're going to pay your income tax, right? Or you're going to do some other uh, thing when you're strapped. So that's a rough one, and. Uh, and therefore, a lot of trees don't get cut down that probably should because they're dead and they're rotten. And then they fall on telephone lines. It costs everybody, town and the state and the private companies, a lot of money uh, and, and, um, to get them back up and running again around the state and around the country from this last, uh, on the up and down the East Coast from this last hurricane. But you can imagine how much money spent on all that. But I, I want you to realize that when people pay uh, high taxes, then they have to cut out other things. And uh, um, some of that is cutting down dead trees that fall on uh, telephone lines and uh, power wires and uh, cable lines and things like that. So uh, this is a very important step that we're us dealing with the state once and for all, trying to come up with the real rules as, as they understand them, as we understand them, and as the Board of Education understands them. And, 
the Gilbert School understands them and then try to get everybody to come up with a plan for attack for the next uh, one to five years and, and, and even beyond because things aren't going to get better in our town uh, right away economically they're not going to they were going to have less students from year to year unless we import them from China or outside of uh, uh, of the state or outside of the town and make more of a private school out of our school system um, we can't afford to be running empty schools. I think that's the selectman's approach here. That's what the fiscal conservatives are trying to do. They actually got uh, six votes to send this letter, and one, one didn't vote for it, but they got six votes to send the letter. That doesn't mean that six people agree uh, about the, the stance, but they're willing, they do, I think, all agree that we need to get more information, even the one that didn't vote in favor of this. I think he was more worried about the wording in the letter than but he does, they all, seven of them, want to understand exactly what the rules are, what do we have to follow, how are they going to be interpreted, and uh, this could be taken uh, to a judge eventually. It might take four or five months to do so, but um, I'll tell you towards the end of the program what plans are in place now. But, you know, this is very important for us to question these, to understand, to get them pinned down, and to get them agreed so that we can plan. Uh, uh, we got a year to plan uh, for next year. We won't have to go out with a supplemental tax increase or take money out of the fund balance or take money from the town to pay for, for uh, any more than we already agreed to in the budget, $18,500,000 uh, uh, as our part. That coupled with any of the state monies that they say in this letter can be moved over uh, uh, and get uh, credit for the MBR uh, as the selectmen believe they should, the fiscal conservatives at least believe they should, then um, uh, over time we can probably get this thing squared away. So uh, it's a difficult problem. Uh, it's no one person's fault. It's everybody has to work together. They all have to pull on the oars at the same time. Uh, they all have to uh, work uh, in, in harmony, and there can't be any of the kind of problem we have now. Uh, and uh, we all can't sit and cover our eyes and ears and not speak. Uh, we have to uh, try to get the facts on the table, just the facts, please, just the facts, as Jack Webb would say on his program. So now I'm going to read you the letter from the superintendent of schools. Of course, he had access to this letter uh, because his letter was written on August 25th, the day after this letter was written. Although I did notice that the superintendent of schools wasn't copied on the town letter. I don't understand that. It should have been nor the Board of Education. Neither of them were copied there. But I would have probably copied them if it were me, but they got it probably through uh, public uh, information, public disclosure. They got a copy of the letter one way or another. And um, I got a copy of both letters from the town manager. They're both in the public domain, and I told him that I didn't want them if they weren't in the public domain. So I do have them here. This is dated August 25th. 2011, and it's from the superintendent of schools. He's only been in the job a few months, um, and was from the Winchester Board of Education, Winchester Board of Education Stationery, 201 Pratt Street, Winston, Connecticut. Telephone 860-379-0706. There's a fax number here too, and it's from Thomas M. Danahy. E.D. period, D. period, Superintendent of Schools, August 25th, 2011. Mr. Brian Mahoney, Chief Financial Officer, Division of Finance and Internal Operations, State Department of Education, State of Connecticut, P.O. 2219, Harford, Connecticut, 06145. Dear Mr. Mahoney, I write in response to your letter dated August 16th, 2011, wherein you state that Winchester 
is non-compliant with, with a mandatory budgetary requirement, MBR, by $1,358,149. Regretfully, I must report that I do not expect that the town will provide funding at this required level. As you may know, the Board of Selectmen held a special meeting on Monday, August 22nd, 2011, to discuss this matter. That body voted six to one in favor of a motion to send a letter to you asking if their information concerning a possible closing of a school building and the fact that 7th and 8th grade students are being sent to the Gilbert School constituted savings to which the town could avail itself in reporting these fictitious savings and hence meeting the MBR. The town seeks to have reductions or credits given to it with regard to compliance with the MBR based upon factors not actually contained in or permitted by the MBR statute, i.e. credit for alleged albeit fictitious cost savings related to school closing a school building that has not actually been closed, credit for alleged enrollment reductions beyond what the MBR statute permits, credits for capital expenses that the town is obliged to incur and which have not been included in the Board of Education's budgeted appropriation. There should be a list up there of uh, points It'll pop up, there we go. Know that our system is in dire need of adequate funding after several years of zero or very low percentage increases which have rendered our district operating on a bare bones funding pattern. Our students, parents, teachers, and staff deserve to start the school year knowing that their teachers in June will be the same one that they had on the first day of school. Should funding remain at the $18,600,000 level that the town appropriated, we violate the following legal requirements. Number one, non-compliance with individualized education plans for students with special needs. Number two, fire code violations for the class size average, which would cli could climb up to an average of 45 students per class. Number three, teacher's contract violation of a stipulation on class size which cannot exceed 18 students for grades K through 3 and 22 students for grades 4 through 6. Number four, no funding for curriculum coordination in advance of the implementation of the common core state standards. Number five, penalty to the town of ECS monies which will create ongoing and future funding arguments by the town to recoup the penalty on the back of the school district. Number six, no special classes in physical education, art, and music and consequently more violations in the teacher's contract that stipulates daily prep time
for teachers. Underfunding will also trigger a chain of events equally important to those enumerated above, including mid-year teacher and staff layoffs, inadequate or no supplies and instructional resources. Page two. No supplies and instructional resources for students. And a learning environment devoid of essentials to allow for effective teaching and learning to occur. The last point is the town discusses taking funds received from the state, most notably the excess cost payments, known as the ECS, and place them in the town fund balance. Winchester did not include excess cost payments as part of the town appropriation in 2008-9, in 2010-11, and does not include them in the 2011-12. We understand that some towns took a different approach and included excess cost payments in their calculations for all years. Regardless of the state's position with respect to such other towns, with respect to Winchester, the state's position has been clear. If excess cost payments were not included in the 2008-2009 and 2010-2011 school years, they cannot be credited to the town's appropriation for MBR calculations. On Monday, August 22, 2011, the Board of Selectmen considered a motion to move excess cost payments, ECS, into fund balance rather than crediting the amount to the Board of Education. Because the Board of Education projected $775,000 of excess cost payments, if the BOS, Board of Selectmen, takes this action, the Board of Education, BOE, will have an additional for shortfall of $775,000 beyond the current MBR shortfall of $1,358,149 for a total shortfall of $2,133,000. One hundred and forty-nine. Because the motion was not duly noticed, no vote was taken. But we anticipate that the motion will appear on the agenda of a future meeting. The statute is the law, and elected officials should obey the law, regardless of whether they agree with the law. We live in a society governed by the law. Beyond that, there is no indication that the state will not impose a $2,716,298 penalty in parentheses, or if the excess cost funding is cut, the higher penalty of twice the shortfall, or a $4,266,000 $298 penalty. Regardless of whether the state imposes a penalty, an $18,600,000 budget, not to mention one redu uh, reduced by another $775,000 or more if excess costs run higher, will decimate our already beleaguered schools and they will face even greater devastation. Oddly enough, in spite of years of low and inadequate funding, our CMT scores indicate that the district has made adequate yearly progress district-wide and safe harbor for the ELL and economically disadvantaged subgroups we serve. We work hard in Winchester and we have a supportive and interested base of parents and community members who want a better educational experience for the students we deserve. Please carry out the intent of the statute and realize our educational needs in Winchester. 
Time is of the essence in this matter. Please expedite triggering the next step to assure that our Connecticut students receive the educational funding that the state of Connecticut allows. Sincerely, Thomas M. Danahy, Superintendent of Schools, Carbon Copy, George Coleman, Acting Commissioner of Education, Carbon Copy, Winchester Board of Education members, Carbon Copy, the Mayor, Carbon Copy, the Winchester Board of Selectmen, Carbon Copy, the Town Manager, Carbon Copy, Senator Andrew Rohrbach, Carbon Copy, Mark Samaruga, Attorney for the Board of Education. Now I'm going to discuss uh, this education uh, problem for a little while here, up to the end of the program. Um, and uh, it's kind of uh, tricky. Uh, not much here spoken about Gilbert. Uh, I don't know what their view, I don't see any letter from Gilbert, but perhaps they were involved in, uh, in this and perhaps they were not involved in the superintendent of schools. Most of the questioning here comes on the, as I understand it, on the K through eight side of the budget and the differences between the Board of Education and the selectmen and um, whatever the differences are out with Gilbert, I do not know. Gilbert did agree to cut their budget by about $600,000 uh, for this uh, fiscal, year, fiscal year that we're in now. So um, we have uh, a lot of facts uh, that need to be defined. Uh, there are a lot of questions in, in both letters, but there's a lot of questions uh, in the uh, letter from the superintendent, um, you know, he does say in here the intent of the law. So there's a lot of, um, I'm, I'm sure he's gone over this with their own attorneys and the unions and everybody else responsible here, probably even some Board of Education members uh, help put it together, I don't know. But um, this is uh, an effort that very clearly these two letters pit the town against the Board of Education and the Board of Education against the town with Gilbert being wagging in the, in the tail there is wagging in the background, uh, probably a, a very efficient group. Uh, but um, this is uh, an issue that uh, is very serious and longstanding and will continue on well into the future. And, you know, don't forget, not only do we have this education issue, but we still got the $12 million bond issue that's proposed by the town for capital improvements all over the place. Uh, maybe a little of that will be reduced because they got some money out of the budget, but it would be uh, very difficult if they don't get some uh, cooperation here from all these groups together and they make some uh, financially responsible decisions. Uh, I didn't see in the uh, in the letter from the superintendent, any mention of the taxpayers, that, that was gone, that wasn't in there, because uh, the taxpayers are also, it says in here, we work hard in Winchester and we have a supportive and interested base of parents and community members who want a better educational experience for the students we serve. Please carry out the intent of the statute and realize our educational needs in Winchester. Well, that's correct. But they should also mention we also have a taxpayer association here, and we also have a, 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 a student that's a system that's declining in, in numbers of students, and the buildings are half empty. And uh, there's uh, probably should be closing a school. We probably should be dealing with uh, with all the uh, expense issues. Doesn't mention anything in here about all the different uh, computer systems we have, and the you know, duplication in superintendents, duplication in uh, in um, the financial side of the business, duplication in the purchasing side for the whole town, uh, duplication in almost everything, maintenance facilities uh, for everything in town. Uh, none of that is mentioned, and that's kind of the issue that uh, the Board of Selectmen are, 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 are trying to face. They're trying to say, look, we gotta begin to manage this town uh, as based upon uh, the needs of everybody in town 
and not just the students or the parents or the teachers, but also the taxpayers and all the other people have to live here that uh, aren't protected by the strongest union in the country, perhaps, and, uh, and uh, are having trouble with jobs or having trouble uh, getting money in. Their taxes are going up. Uh, they got hurricanes. They got the uh, market on Wall Street crashing for the second time in the last few years. So all this has to be balanced. Now, the state itself has problems, as you all know, uh, a lot of problems, and uh, economically, uh, just like uh, they had to take on the unions at the state level. Some they won, some they didn't. Uh, the unions had to make concessions. The uh, workers had to make concessions, uh, which is kind of a what I call a more practical, normal way of doing things that everybody pitches in and and uh, tries to help each other in time of need and, uh, and all neighbor neighboring towns and cities uh, uh, the uh, Tarrington uh, mayor uh, asked the Board of Education down there to come in at an even budget and they did so and there was a lot of talk about it and it was a lot of concern and they recently had a superintendent quit down there after a year of doing an what everybody thinks was an excellent job because of all the flack he was taking in the newspaper, says he. So it, this is very, very tough stuff. And uh, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Now, I do understand con uh, completely what the town needs to do. They need to manage this situation. They need to manage this budget. And if uh, frequent conversation and frequent uh, negotiation with the state and teachers unions and Board of Education is involved that's their job to do that that's why we elected them we elected them to do that they said they were going to do that before they got elected at least uh, three or four of them did not, maybe not all seven uh, they uh, just a few years ago they wanted to build a whole new school uh, and uh, yeah, you know, a lot of money for that kind of thing as well as other expenditures and um, that the fiscal conservatives weren't in favor of that, of course. Um, a bit like at the national level, same sort of problem. So now, on the other hand, you got to understand that the Winchester Board of Education, they, they got to fight for their uh, uh, true needs. Uh, and uh, we don't have agreement now on what the true needs are and what the true, true needs are that we can afford. And um, if my children ever said to me, Brian, uh, Dad, I'd like to go to uh, Harvard or Yale, I'd say, well, have you got the grades? No. <laughs> well, and maybe someone would have said yes, but have you got the money? No. You want to go in debt for a couple hundred thousand for the rest of your life? Well, not really. You think you can get a scholarship? Probably not, Dad, because you make too much money, so we might not be able to get a scholarship. Well. In the end, I said, okay, probably not going to get to go to those schools. None of them did ask me, by the way, but if they had, that this would be the conversation because they realized, just like I did, I would never ask my dad to pay for me to go through Yale or Harvard or anything like that. Um, I'd w do like I did do. I'd work my way through Kansas University instead. When I first went to Kansas, and one of the reasons I went there, there were many reasons I went, but one of them was that tuition was 50 bucks for an out-of-state student a year. How's that? Maybe it was a semester, but it was $50. And that included um, sports activities and the use of the medical facility on the campus and a lot of other small things like that. And when I left four years later, it was $500 a semester instead of $50. I went up tenfold in four years. Now it's, you know, a lot higher than that even. It was a land-grant college to start with. But anyway, that's what kids like me did when we couldn't afford to go to the big Ivy League, which at that time had more status than perhaps it does today. And um, it's tough. It's tough on everybody. Hard decisions have to be made. And as I always say on my programs, and have, a, especially on the Planning for Success program, I kind of got planned out there, so I changed the name of the program to Getting Things Done because the planning wasn't working. It was, well, town has a tendency to over plan, over plan, over plan, and under get things done, under get things done, and under get things done. So I thought I'd try to concentrate on that for a while. But you, you got to make hard decisions. 
decisions are tough. They're tough at the state level. They got all people who contribute their campaigns to get elected. They got, uh, they're beholden to large corporations, large institutions, unions, all kinds of things like that. Uh, and um, the federal level is a bit similar, maybe in spades. Um, and uh, it's tough. It's hard to make. It's hard to say no. I was once in a store a few weeks ago, and I was in a st secondhand store in a state, and uh, talking to the owner. And uh, somebody came in with uh, some things they wanted to see if they could be sold in a secondhand store. And the owner had to say, well, to be honest with you, I don't think they can be sold in a secondhand store. I think they're more for a, uh, a yard auction, a yard uh, tag sale. They're not that valuable. Um, they're not considered antiques. They're not considered um, things that we would normally have in our secondhand stores. So after he was done talking to the person, I said, boy, we were alone at the time. I said, you have to make a lot of hard decisions in here. A lot of people probably come in and say, hey, how much is this? thing work. Uh, matter of fact, if you watch the Antiques Roadshow, which is kind of managed a little bit for all kinds of reasons, professional reasons, but, you know, some people are told, hey, you thought you had a $10 million item there, and it's worth 50 cents, you know, or you thought you had a 50 cent item, it's worth 10 million. So, uh, it's tough to be in business, it's tough to run a town, it's tough to run a board of education, it's tough to run a school system like Gilbert or K-8. through uh, because you have to say no a lot. You have to say no, we can't afford that. You have to say no and you have to say yes too, but no is the hardest thing to say. And the more responsibility that you have as a manager, and, uh, and this responsibility is for getting things done, is you have to say no more than you say yes. And what you do hope after a while is people get the message and um, they don't even ask you anymore. They say, oh, okay, I understand. Um, we're, we're in a big recession. Uh, we just got hit with another whack here a few weeks ago on Wall Street. Uh, people are getting laid off at Bank of America and all other places. The Europe's in deep trouble. And, uh, and I understand, so I won't ask you uh, for uh, for this, I'll go out and figure out a way to do it uh, in a different manner. And you go do it. And then the boss doesn't have to say no, or person in charge, or the mom and dad, or the edu edu educators, or the selectmen, or the board of finance, or um, the superintendent of schools, or the state, or the town attorney, or whatever. Uh, one, by, one, one of the ex-selectmen said to me, he was a Democrat, he told me, I heard him say a few years ago, probably on television or something, that whenever two lawyers get involved, one of them loses, usually. Now, that isn't totally true. There's a lot of compromises, too, along the way, which we hope we're going to get here. So we got two lawyers here, uh, and uh, in the end, uh, I don't know where either of them stands, but, you know, the law has to be adjudicated, and there probably have to be a judge involved. That'll take months to do that. It's hoping that we can come to an agreement amongst ourselves before that happens. But um, i also tell you that uh, when I first became a director of a major computer company, I had about, I had a pretty big budget, maybe, I don't know, four, five hundred million. It was pretty big. And uh, I went to uh, my boss and I said, we need 30% increase in the budget this year to make all these things happen. And he said, well, Brian, I hate to tell you no, but you're only gonna get a 1% increase. And he gave me the reasons why, were very simple. And the revenue was down, just like it is here in our town. State ain't doing so hot either. And the feds aren't doing so hot either, so it's uh, kind of kind of complex. But he said, "You're getting one percent, and it's because we we're not getting enough revenue in to support these things. We're going to just have to figure out a way to do without them, work around the problems." So the next year, I went back before I did my budget, which takes a lot of time. A lot of frustration, 
a lot of work for a lot of people in the organization. I went to my manager and I said, he was an executive vice president of the company, I said, and I was kind of young, I was about 28. I said, well, how much am I gonna get this year? And he said, half a percent. And I said, why is that? I said, we really need this stuff. We really gotta get going. And he said, well, revenue's down. It hasn't gone up any, it's gone down even more. So we're gonna have to do with less. Now the other thing that happened at my young age, which I've talked about on Planning for Success is, and I'm using these examples to, to try to get the message home to people, <laughs> that is that I joined, the, I took the job, I came from England to America to work for a while in a senior position and a uh, director position, and the guy said to me, my boss, executive vice president, he said, Brian, you're gonna have to go to Phoenix, Arizona and close our development center there. And I said to him, why is that? And he said, well, we can't afford it. We don't have the revenue. We don't have the money. We're downsizing. You'll have to go out and talk to the people. There are probably 50 people there, all uh, senior people, programmers, engineers, um, that kind of thing. And I said, but it's two weeks before Christmas. I said, well, you want me to go out two weeks before Christmas and lay off the 50 people that are out there or reassign them elsewhere? Well, I can't really assign them elsewhere. We don't have any other jobs for them. We're going to have to lay them off. And I said, well, why, why should I go a few weeks before Christmas? And he said, well, if you let them wait till Christmas, before you tell them they're going to be laid off, they'll spend a lot of money at Christmas, have big plans, and then they'll really be mad when you let them go right after Christmas. He said, I recommend and suggest that you get out there, close the place down, tell them they got X days to work, maybe 30 or 60 or 90 or whatever before they were laid off, and they could actually plan and they wouldn't spend as much during Christmas. So I did it. Now, I can tell you, when I went out there, a young guy, small kids, come from a factory background, you know, it was emotional for me. It was tough to say that to the people, and they didn't like me for saying it. They have a tendency to say, oh, it's him. He's the problem. Well, I was just a messenger, really. And I had to do it in such a way that you know, that was as respectful as it could be in a dire circumstance like that. I had another example, plenty of them, where I went around the world to tell chairman of companies that their computer system was going to be off for six weeks while we got new hardware, software, and that was in the days when the computer system ran everything for the airlines, the banks, couldn't get on an airplane without it. We really hurt these people. Some of them might have put out of business. But I had to go out, survey the situation, get everybody together, find out what the problems were, orchestrate the support from the rest of the company. It was a major company, one of the largest computer companies in the world. Organize the uh, support. and get it there and try to keep the customer happy while I was doing it. Now, that meant staying in weeks and months in other states and other countries to show the customer that we meant business. I could go on and on with stories like this because I was a troubleshooter, okay? And when troubleshooters get the most power is when the company, country, city, town, whatever, is in the most trouble. We're probably not in the same trouble we were in the flood. I don't know. I wasn't here then. But we're, we're in a lot of trouble here. And the way it's going to be resolved is by these entities getting together, stop the 
the day we get to the right joint letters, that's the day when we won the battle. And especially if Gilbert's included too. That's the day when we win the battle. But we're a long way from that. We got a couple letters on this program tonight that are diametrically opposed. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot of money at stake, not only for the town, the Board of Education, the Finance Board, but for the taxpayers as well. So we got a lot of work to do. Now, I got about seven or eight minutes left, so I'm going to say that uh, the last time I also made a, one mistake, and I want to correct that. I did correct it on the internet, but I said that uh, the Republican Party had been supported by the Taxpayer Association. That was a mistake. It really is was the Independent Party that supported the Republican Party. The Taxpayer Association usually doesn't formally uh, um, back uh, candidates, they kind of let everybody make up their own mind, might give them a little advice and guidance, but uh, they're a very good organization, very strong organization, so I expect they'll do the right thing. I think they'll probably vote their pocketbook as uh, they usually do. There will be exceptions. It'll be a normal distribution curve, probably, but uh, all right. Now, in the last few minutes here, I want to say that the next step on this, the letters have gone off to Hartford. Um, everybody in town uh, has to, has got a copy and they're reading them. And uh, there's going to be a meeting in Hartford today. Uh, this is the evening. I'm re pre recording this, so you won't, uh, I won't be able to report about these meetings because I'll be, I got some personal business I have to attend to. But there's a meeting in Hartford September 1st, 2011. And I guess everybody's going to be there. The state people will be there, the lawyers will be there, the financial people will be there, our selectmen will be there, our board of education people will be there, our town manager will be there, our lawyers will be there. So this is great. They're going to go there. They're going to go through these letters. They're going to say, what do we do here? How do we resolve this problem? Um, how can we get this done in a hurry, like the uh, superintendent of school says? Let's get it done. Let's make a decision. And uh, they're going to go through that. They might even set up a road pathway to the future, which I hope they do. How can we do a little bit each year, too, so that we, we, uh, we, get, we don't get in this pickle again? And uh, I have asked Channel 13 if I could get somebody down there to film that. So if it does get filmed, and it's not always easy to get people to film things, but if they can get down to Hartford at 11 o'clock on September 4th, 2011, and they're allowed to film the meeting, then we'll do that, and that'll be at my expense. And then um, we'll uh, show it either on my program next week or on the internet and a future program, if we can get it uh, uh, filmed. Now, after that meeting, the, uh, there'll be a meeting of the selectmen at the same day, September 1st, 2011, at 7 p.m., as I saw in the paper today. My guess is that that, that that will be to go over what happened in Hartford during the day should it not get canceled or reassigned to another date. But anyway, that'll be very interesting. So on the 2nd of September, you should read the uh, newspapers and then on Friday, the local newspaper when it's published, uh, and you'll see what the outcome of the meeting at the state was and what the outcome of the meeting with the selectmen. There'll be comments from the Board of Education members. They may even schedule their own meeting. and. Uh, I haven't talked much about their other problems. They still got problems getting the Board of Education uh, in shape and all that kind of thing. But now I'm going to show you my picture of Jack Webb again. And I want to say again, ladies and gentlemen, some aspects of the story you have just heard in these letters is most likely true. The names have not been changed to protect the innocent. And as Jack Webb would say, just the facts, please. Just the facts. Let's all agree to the facts, the way forward. Let's not hear, speak, or see evil. Let's concentrate on the facts. The selectmen have made a good start by attaching three pages of numbers that they think are the facts. They may not be, but we'll find that out. So with that,
I'm going to play once more the theme from Dragnet as we exit the program. Thank you very much. See you next week. <laughs>